Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to another Tabadla Policy Roundtable. We had a really uh, fantastic discussion with the former State Bank uh, Deputy Governor, former Acting Governor, Murtaza Sayyid, the head of Infrazamin, uh, Mahin Rahman, and uh, Khurram Hussain, one of the most uh, influential and on point uh, economic analysts in the country. Uh, do watch that. Uh, we, we had that uh, day before yesterday. Today, uh, I think as a natural consequence of that conversation, we thought it would be important to start digging into what the implications of this economic crisis are. And perhaps one of the most profound implications is what will happen to people's diets, what will happen to food security, what will happen to nutrition, particularly in a country that suffers from the kind of nutritional meta crisis that it has suffered from for so many years. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel in just a second, but I wanted to go through some of the big picture uh, data points that uh, some of the colleagues here at the Bad Lab have put together in terms of just how challenging the nutrition crisis in Pakistan is. Um, I won't go through every slide here, but there are some sort of data points that are really just stunning. 40% um, of Pakistani children are stunted. Almost 37% uh, of households in Pakistan are food insecure. Uh, less than half uh, of all Pakistani kids uh, receive uh, any kind of breast milk um, until the age of six. And similarly, less than half receive any within the first hour of birth. Uh, net net, the implications of malnutrition for the GDP uh, are as much as three percent of GDP. But I think it's more than just GDP. I mean, uh, it's not. It should be no surprise that Pakistan ranks very low out of 121 countries on the Global Hunger Index. Pakistan is at number 99, uh, which is the lower end of the scale on that front. More, I think, interesting is the fact that really, if you look at progress in terms of uh, nutrition levels in Pakistan, stunting, for example. Um, the numbers just haven't changed. In fact, from 1984, when nutrition was at its highest, if you will, from a stunting perspective, at 36%, in 2018, we're back at about 40%. Now, this is about the same percentage that is uh, that has been prevalent throughout the sort of uh, lifetime of anyone uh, that is alive in Pakistan or is Pakistani. That's a stunning failure of public policy and of society to address what is clearly a problem that, that affects the entire population. Because remember, a stunted uh, child is going to grow up to be less economically viable, less vibrant than uh, someone whose nutritional needs are being met fully. Uh, Wasting uh, is a big issue. The floods and other kinds of extreme climate events exacerbate those issues. Uh, maternal and child health, which is deeply interconnected with uh, nutrition. The numbers there have been abysmal for, for years in this country. Uh, there is a gender dimension to all of this that cannot be ignored. Uh, more adolescent girls are overweight compared to males, and almost one in eight adolescent girls is underweight compared to one in five. So the percentages um, uh, here are uh, quite interesting. Um, rural areas are treated differently than urban areas. And when it comes to malnourishment among women of reproductive ages, uh, that's an especially uh, complex problem given that uh, the fetus begins to account for cognition uh, by the second trimester. So when you have malnutrition in the mother, you are baking in cognitive uh, disability would be maybe too strong. And I'll go to uh, some of our expert panelists to explain some of this better. But really, this is a whole of life cycle problem. You can't fix nutrition at age five or at age 12 or at age 24. Nutrition has to be fixed uh, amongst lactating mothers and amongst women who are likely to be pregnant. And given fertility rates in this country, uh, that means that nutrition as a public policy challenge is especially gendered as far as the solution to many of these problems. Um, 
food insecurity is uh, is rampant. More than half of all households are food insecure. And so we have uh, a, a spectrum of challenges on the nutrition side, which predate the existing economic crisis. And that's really the most important point uh, that uh, I think experts would want to make. But since we've got the experts with us, uh, and we're very lucky to have a fantastic panel, I'll ask uh, my team to bring them onto the screen. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Farhana Shahid. Uh, she is a specifically in nutrition and maternal and neonatal health uh, specialist with a PhD in the field and many years of experience. She works for Globeside. I'm grateful that she's joined us. We have Shandana Khan, who's the CEO of the Rural, Rural Support uh, Program Network. Uh, Shandana has spent almost a quarter century working with communities across the country, uh, coalescing, mobilizing, and understanding the challenges of communities, especially in Pakistan's rural areas. Thank you for joining us. Uh, not for the first time, Shandana, you're a friend, a great friend to the Bad Lab, and I'm grateful for all of your insights and your support and for all the amazing work you and your team does all around the country. Uh, we are also joined by Adil Mansoor. Adil is one of the bright lights of Pakistani journalism when it comes to covering the economy and super grateful that you're with us, Adil, thank you. And uh, I'm especially happy today to welcome Dr. Steve Hankey. Uh, Steve is uh, known widely across the world as somebody that understands not just economics and monetary policy, but also a wide array of fields associated with this. So Steve will have views not just on, on the economy and on the dollar rupee parity and on the nature of the Pakistani economic crisis, but also its political dimensions and the food and nutrition angle. Uh, Steve, thank you for joining us. It, this has been a long time coming. You and I have been talking for a while on, on getting you on this screen. So I'm, I'm really happy that you've been able to join us. I know this is early morning for you, so especially grateful that you've made that uh, uh, this kind of time journey, although this is virtual, but uh, great to have people from around the world joining us. Um, I want to start the conversation with you, Dr. Shahid. Uh, what is, is there something to be concerned about with the, with, with the current economic crisis? Because it seems to me that given that we already have uh, what, would, what would be a national emergency, I think, in most countries, as far as nutrition is concerned, with the way the rupee is going, the way inflation is going, and the way hope is going. Of course, we're having this conversation live at a time when we don't know uh, what's going to happen in Lahore uh, between the government and, uh, and, and the opposition parties, between the military and, 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 uh, and political parties. With all this insecurity and with the economic insecurity in particular, my, my last conversation of this nature was about the default. So with all of this happening, how does this impact specifically the community of leaders and, and sort of champions for nutrition like yourself? How are you guys looking at this problem? How stark a com complication of the problem might we be looking at, Dr. Farhana Shahid? Thank you so much, Musharraf. I think so. Um, first of all, apologies about um, my throat. Uh, if I'm not clear, I try to be as uh, clear as possible. So I'll start uh, with a statement uh, with regards to the nutrition in Pakistan. Uh, nutrition is um, often regarded as a, as an intervention of emergency. Uh, although the statistics that you have shown um, just now, it's just not the recent survey, but the consecutive nutrition, national nutrition survey, they showed that the country is, is, is an emergency. It's not the flood, it's not the economy. It's previously, a few, the end of, uh, of uh, malnutrition. And if I can say that the country is facing triple burden of malnutrition, which means that it's not just the undernutrition, but also overnutrition is come as a major challenge in the field of nutrition and also the micronutrient deficiencies uh, in the uh, pregnant mothers and uh, in all uh, sort of the segment of the population. Uh, and uh, as you, uh, in your uh, talk, also mentioned about the life cycle, so it's, it starts from um, the, uh, the pregnancy. If you see a thousand days approach, right from the pregnancy, our mothers are, are deficient. They are undernourished, they are, um, they are micronutrient deficiencies, and then because of uh, several other reasons, key 
uh, go into the uh, the cycle of malnutrition with every pregnancies and um, uh, and and then the newborn into the life the first two years are important there they determine the future of uh, of the child so in in if, um, if the nutrition environment of the of this um, uh, of the child less than two years of age not met there are possible consequences like for example starting and if once occurred um, if time, it, it is irreversible so uh, you can like manage and nutrition you can manage the wasting but you cannot burst the uh, stunting and as uh, uh, literature and evidence say that the stunting can cause later in their life for these kids uh, the problem in competing uh, with their counterparts in education, in, uh, in professional uh, uh, environment as well. So uh, it, it's not just the nutrition, uh, but also it's, it's a country's development issue, uh, I would say. And as you can see, the National Nutrition Survey findings, the minimum meal frequency is, is only 12% of uh, the kids are, uh, are having this. And 82%, um, and uh, um, also one in seven children are actually having minimum dietary diet. So it's just not the meal. Uh, it's just not the carbohydrate that a child needs, or the protein, or just the fat they need. They need all basic, uh, all the food groups, all the um, nutrients to, to stay healthy and to grow and develop and to uh, come into uh, the productive life uh, and, and, and contribute to the development of a country. And as you rightly mentioned, that there is a deficit of three GDP uh, in economic, um, uh, when you see from uh, in, in terms of economic uh, value. So um, I, I believe that uh, uh, the, uh, the, there are several uh, factors related to it, uh, in which you rightly says the price hike uh, Price hike, emergency situations, climate change, resilience, and also uh, the investment in agriculture said um, uh, agriculture system and food system is is challenging in in addressing the issue of nutrition uh, in the country. Right. Thank you, uh, Varana. I think that's a really good sort of opening, uh, Shandana. If I could come to you. You are obviously constantly in touch with uh, a whole variety of uh, people all around the country. You're engaged with community-based organizations, with social mobilizers. What have you seen over the last year in terms of food security across the country? How stark or how profound is this challenge? Is, there, is this an overstatement? Is this typical development while I was just wailing and crying for nothing, um, whereas, you know, the informal economy is good enough and, and is uh, is the savior of the people? Uh, or do we have something to really be concerned about here, Shandana? Thank you, Musharraf, and uh, greetings to all my co-panelists. Um, I'm not sure, Musharraf, I can answer this question because for one, you know, our work is really so micro level and I can give you some examples um, of, of what is happening. We have seen that where we mobilize communities and have inputs, especially inputs like access to finance and skills training, uh, that, you know, incomes were increasing. Say we, we started these programs in 2017-18. By 2021, we did some impact assessments and we found increases in incomes, uh, you know, of, of um, up to 23-26%. Uh, By the way, that, that is in terms of percentages sounds high, but these uh, these amounts are very low because those households have very low incomes. So a 26% increase in an average household in Kech, uh, Balochistan, poor household is only 3,100 rupees. Um, so you can imagine what the total earning of that household is. As, as uh, you know, this economic situation got worse in the country, we found that the these incomes have started to decrease. So what we feel is that no matter what we did in this particular case, we're sort of, you know, people are sort of keeping afloat. Uh, and, you know, the impacts that we were having were actually getting eroded. Um, now, of course, you know, the biggest spend is on food and, of course, there is any health crisis. And uh, if I, I, I cannot really tell you the impact on consumption, but, you know, I can tell you that we work in places like Dadu and Jamshoro in Sindh, 
uh, which which have a you know fifty percent uh, stunting uh, amongst children. Uh, we've managed to uh, you know through the the, the, the mid arm circumference uh, measurement uh, of children, we've managed to help the Sin government put in place nutrition stabilization centers that have cured thirty eight thousand children. But I think looking at the overall situation, thirty eight thousand children is probably a very small number. I'm trying to connect, you know, the, the two things that we're talking about, you know, the incomes, the impact on food and nutrition, which is, of course, a much longer thing. So I think, you know, this, this apart from this inflation, um, a lot can be done on working on nutrition. I mean, the places we worked, the, um, the government didn't have nutrition stabilization centers in these places. So they've been set up and luckily the government, you know, at least has said that they're committed to taking these over. Uh, after uh, our project uh, finishes. So, uh, Shandana, that's really useful, and and that connectivity is especially, I think, helpful. Adil, uh, I can't see Adil, but if Adil is uh, still with us, Adil, I want to maybe go back to something that Farhana said about uh, the nature of the crisis, and especially the you know the kinds of nutrition that people need, especially children need. What are you finding in terms of the breakdown of different nutritional elements as far as this current crisis is concerned? I know that um, at a recent event, you spoke about the protein crisis within the nutrition crisis. So do explain what is happening within the components of nutrition across the country. Adil? Adil, we can't hear you. We, I, I can, at least I can't make out what you're saying. No, you're still, you're still mute. Okay, in the uh, uh, maybe, uh, my, maybe the team can get you uh, back on in terms of uh, sound, uh, and we'll just switch over real quick to Dr. Steve. Uh, Thank you, Steve. This uh, this crisis in Pakistan, uh, you know, is is one that has not uh, come as a surprise. This was uh, a lot of us saw it many miles away, many months away. When did you start to get alarmed about the situation in Pakistan? I know you've been following it very, very closely, but at what point in time did you did you see that this was maybe going off the rail here in Pakistan? You'll have to unmute, Steve. Okay. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Uh, okay. Sheriff, uh, gl glad to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you asked, when When did I really see the crisis coming? Well, the, the, the Pakistan has been embroiled in it kind of an endemic crisis for for years so it, it's it's nothing it's nothing new uh it's it's basically a, a country that's been off the rails uh al almost since the beginning uh the the basic problem in terms of economics and the reason that economics is is important in this discussion about nutrition and food is very simple. No money, no food. We've, we, we've already had allusions to that by some of the earlier uh, discussions that we've had today. So Pakistan, why, why have I said it's been a, a disaster since day one? There, it's an institutional problem. You have weak, very weak institutions, which leads to currency problems. And, and if you look at the rupee, it's nothing new for you since January of 2022, the rupee is down about 26%, 27%. Since January 1st, it's down about 20% uh, against the US dollar. That's, that's one problem associated with the weak institutions. Another related problem is no fiscal discipline you have very large fiscal deficits. Last year, of course, was exceptional. It was 7.8% deficit. 
of uh, with regard to GDP, which is very high, but it's per, it's really in the range of five and a half percent, if uh, something something like that. That's what all the projections have going forward. That that's a very high number, and then we come to inflation. We've already mentioned inflation and the problem uh, associated with that. The official inflation rates are uh, 31.55% per year. I actually measure it accurately every day. And the reality is that today it's 67.25%. That, that's over twice as high as the official rate. So the official rate gives you one thing. It's not reality, it's really rubbish. The, the actual inflation is about double what the official number is. And then uh, we, we, we come to kind of the solution, the so-called solution. It's always the IMF passing the begging bowl. That's a, a Pakistan always is in a crisis and always passing the begging bowl. So they've had 23 IMF programs and of course none of them have worked. So how do you fix this? That's the question. And, and that's something I've had a lot of experience with in, in the real world. I'm not talking about theory and I'm talking about reality of doing things. Something called a currency board system would fix the currency problem, the fiscal imbalance problem and the inflation problem. And that would go a long way towards more money, more food, more money, more food. And, and more stability. So what is a currency board system? A currency board system is one in which the, the rupee would be issued and, and it would be backed by an anchor currency, let's say the US dollar, and it would trade at a fixed exchange rate to the US dollar and be freely convertible at that fixed exchange rate. And it would be credible because the requirement is that a currency board must have 100% anchor currency reserves backing up the local currency. So if the anchor was a dollar, the rupee would, would really become a clone of the US dollar. And what would happen? Inflation would disappear overnight. It would go down to roughly the US level. Interest rates would come down. They're, they're now at the highest rate they've been since 1996 in Pakistan. They, they would come crashing down and the economy would get a, a huge confidence shock. And what about the fiscal? The fiscal situation would correct itself because the state bank would no longer be able to extend credit to the fiscal authorities. So the, the, the budget would have to be more or less balanced. And, and that's what happens in all currency board countries. The, the, the budget's almost always balanced. Let me give you one Steven, example. Steven. You, you, sure, you sure, go ahead. Okay, so when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about crises like Pakistan that I've actually done currency board reforms in. Estonia, 1992. Lithuania in 94, Bulgaria in 1997, Bosnia, Herzegovina in 1997. Now let's take Bulgaria. Bulgaria had an inflation that was running at 242% per month, not per year, per month, 242%. We put in the currency board that smashed the inflation almost immediately. It was down into single digits within 30 days the interest rates a year after we put the currency board in, in 1997, the interest rates, the money market interest rates were 2%. And the foreign reserves expanded. They didn't lose foreign reserves. This was a confidence shock. The foreign reserves in one year were three times higher than when we put the currency board in. The banking system had been insolvent when we put the currency board in in July 1997. A year later, it was solvent. The economy was growing. Now, how about the fiscal affairs? Because they've had the currency board now for over 25 years. The budget is 
almost always balanced no matter what government comes in because the politicians with the currency board, they're in a straitjacket. That, that's the problem in Pakistan. You have to put the politicians in a, in a st fiscal straitjacket because, and you do because they can't go to the state bank and, and receive credit. So this is, this, uh, is, this is going to be, Steve, this is going to be music to the ears of many people in Pakistan that don't just want to put politicians in a straitjacket. They want to put them, uh, uh, they want to put them on, uh, on death row. Um, uh, and I smile because, of course, this has been a debate in our country for, for many, many years. But, uh, but I think, look, I think that given the nature of the crisis, I'm really glad that you've proposed the currency board. I know that there's several serious people uh, that would consider this seriously. And I know that there's a lot of people that would think of this proposal as being uh, not realistic and maybe maybe a little bit outlandish. And they would be very uh, agitated by this proposal. And I think that the time for these conversations in this country is now. And the reason that I wanted to have this conversation during a conversation about nutrition is because I do think we're facing some modicum of economic and nutrition emergency. Adil, nobody's better placed to contextualize this speculation about how bad things are vis-a-vis -vis the economy and nutrition. And maybe it's better that you speak after Steve. So, so I think maybe technology saved us there. Do well, try to... Well, we'll see. Steve, I, I was going to go to Adil and then, and then I'll come back to you. Okay, fine. Adil? Oh, we still can't hear you, brother. Yeah, there's... I think there's a... There's a mic adjustment issue uh, at your end. Say something, Adil. No, no, we, we, we can't, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe you disconnect the, the headphones. You'll have to unmute now because you're, you're muted. You just unmute. Yeah, it's still not working. Which is unfortunate. Maybe I can ask the team to kind of uh, take out Adil and, and bring him back in. Um, Farhana, this this uh, while we wait for Adil to reconnect, Farhana, this this crisis, you know, the, the economic dimension to the crisis is what it is. But what have you noticed? Uh, you know, we had uh, Shandana. I hope she's still with us. She mentioned that prior to the crisis, we'd seen improvements in income in rural areas. Uh, between 20 and 25 percent. Uh, Steve says the official uh, inflation rate, which is what it is, 30 to 30 to 40 percent, is much lower than the real inflation rate, which is in the 60s, uh, according to Steve's calculations. So when we put all that together, and then we hear Shandana tell us that actually real incomes, not real incomes, actual incomes, nominal incomes in some of these rural areas over the last year have gone down. That means that not only are people not keeping up with inflation, but they're actually losing ground relative to the position they were in before the beginning of the crisis. How does this manifest itself in terms of what we're seeing in hospitals, what we're seeing uh, in terms of lady health uh, workers, what we're seeing in terms of population welfare centers, in terms of the interface between people and the state? How does this manifest itself? Is there evidence that things are getting worse or are we still basing a lot of our analysis just on the big bad numbers? Farhana, you'll have to unmute before you speak. Yeah, thank you so much. I think so, uh, I uh, agree with uh, Steve that the crisis is, um, is, is much bigger than what is, uh, what is seen. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I would uh, highlight for example, the Muslim Support Program, which is very much targeted to uh, lower two quintiles of uh, the socioeconomic status. So um, I know that uh, the, the provision of uh, cash uh, is always debatable, but at the same time, uh, there are other initiatives, like, for example, the Nashonuma Program as well, in which the pregnant and lactating mothers and, and children are, are being uh, benefited with, the, with these. A supplementary nutritional foods uh, by the government. So these are like eight million almost uh, 
um, uh, women. They're targeted by the Ministry of uh, Public and Social Safety. Uh, but I, I agree uh, that this number is uh, quite, that the percentage is quite low from that population also. So uh, there are other uh, views that needs to be, uh, 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 should be explored. And uh, as you were saying that, and, and I mentioned earlier as well, that it's uh, just not sufficient, uh, but uh, in hospital and at the community level and the basic health unit, we see uh, the consequences of malnutrition uh, in the form of uh, infectious diseases and uh, high, and mortality rate in, in uh, that uh, group, the, the vulnerable group of the population, both uh, mothers and uh, children less than five years of age. And this is one of the indicators less than five years mortality, um, uh, mortality due to diarrhea, mortality due to pneumonia. We are still struggling uh, to improve uh, those situations. This, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Farhanish, I, I think this uh, point that you make about the instruments of support is an important one, and maybe maybe we can explore that a little bit. Uh, but before I come to you, Shandana, on questions around uh, both the Benazir Income Support Program and some of these different specific targeted uh, subsidies that the government is trying, um, maybe we'll try Adil one more time. Adil, do you want to, uh, can somebody bring, somebody Adil, bring back Adil back here? Am I audible now? You are. You Hallelujah. are. Hallelujah. Perfect. Uh, so, okay, so just starting from where we left earlier and trying to contextualize of what the situation is right now. I believe that we are not just in the middle of a malnourishment crisis. That is something Pakistan has been in, in one form or the other since inception. I think we, this is the first time in at least many decades that we are facing a hunger crisis. I grew up in the 90s and 2000s and I think while we all knew that the, the incidence of malnourishment and stunting and wasting is very high in Pakistan, we also believe that uh, nobody goes to sleep hungry in Pakistan. It, it is obviously anecdotal, but that's what the sense was. This is the one thing that has been reversing in the recent months, but more importantly, over the last five years. Uh, more and more Pakistanis, I believe, uh, in the past five years are now no longer just facing malnourishment but they're also facing hunger malnourishment is the case where you the people uh, reach the caloric requirements through inferior calories such as through carbs such as through sugar and vegetable fat and and uh, banaspati etc over the past few months and maybe over the past five years what has happened is that all of those inferior calories have also become really expensive. Just to con contextualize, uh, we are being told that this is the highest level of inflation, inflation since 70s. On an annual basis, that is true. But what is not true is that in the 70s, and especially 73, 74, Pakistan saw a, a very high rate of inflation reaching in 30s, but which dropped subsequently very quickly by 75, 76, and 77. Over the last five years, Pakistan has seen double-digit inflation in 40 out of 60 months, which basically means that prices have doubled in basically five years, prices of everything. In, during this time, daily wages, uh, the average uh, daily wage has not increased by more than two-thirds. So basically, the first thing that takes a hit is your uh, food expenditure. How? Now. Let me try to add a, a couple of uh, more insights over here. For example, uh, over the past 10, 12, 15, 20 years, the prices of dairy and red meat and other uh, commodities, other kitchen essentials have always outpaced inflation. That has been a fact. But it has always been balanced out by lower inflation or, or lower price increases in areas such as wheat, flour, sugar, uh, poultry. Uh, which is one area which has seen rapid decline in real term over the 20 years. Now, on one hand, prices of commodities such as dairy, milk, meat are increasing at the same pace as they did in the past. You have additionally, additional inflation coming in from non-conventional commodities such as flour and, and even from carbs and fats such as vegetable fat, banaspati and other things. 
more importantly i'd like to emphasize and this associate people from this uh, notion that this is imported inflation this is not imported inflation this is inflation caused purely by poor policies when somebody is is surviving on subsistent uh, budget what you can do is if you cannot reduce prices of wheat overnight because you are facing a shortage or there is a global uh, shortage of wheat and prices are escalating due, due to super commodity cycle or or or, or a, or the or the Russian Ukrainian war what you can make sure is that people have to spend less on other commodities such as poultry such as farm eggs such as sugar such as vegetable fat we have made that also impossible and by and through extremely terrible policies in areas such as poultry where we have made sure that uh, the one source of protein which has become uh inexpensive or become more affordable for uh, masses in the last 20 years is also not no longer affordable poultry prices 25 years ago used to be higher than the prices of red meat the beef for the last 25 years that changed with a higher productivity more innovation in, in that sector but again poor policies has reversed that and now as you can see poultry is as expensive in pakistan as beef once again now that is the crisis the crisis is that you can no longer fill the stomachs of people with inferior calories also because inferior calories have also become really expensive so i think uh, adil this this is a troubling sort of uh, bit of insight and one that you know we wouldn't ordinarily ordinarily have access to the fact that traditionally uh, if if tradition can be surmised in in two decades but over the last two decades we've seen an improvement in people's ability to ability to consume pro yes. and now and now we're seeing, we're seeing and now we're seeing this uh, a reversal on this this is this is deeply troubling uh, shandana the the point that farhana raised about bis uh nashurnama and many other programs i can think of two that are that are relatively new for example just yesterday i think the prime minister announced that the federal government would distribute wheat flour among a million residents of islamabad free of charge during ramzan now quite apart from the economic viability or the administrative challenges in such a policy quite apart from the fact you know that uh, utility stores subsidies are also contested in terms of administrative cost and and net benefit what's better a cash grant or uh you know cheaper petrol for motorcycles those are all debates that will continue to happen but in terms of what we're seeing across uh the villages uh around the country is there a sense that the benazir income support program is able to address some of these gaps uh so for example if a household that is receiving a bisp uh yes. cash grant versus mm -hmm. one that isn't do you observe a material difference in in their ability to consume perhaps in their ability to bridge the gap in the protein deficit that adil is talking about shandana so um you know to be honest i i have myself have not seen any uh data that shows this correlation but definitely from what people spend the bis grant on uh you know uh, uh, there is a, a fair percentage i don't know the percentage but a fair percentage of spending on consumption now one of the things with bis is that you know uh, of course this is important and this may not be the politically correct time to make this statement because of poverty levels uh, you know increasing but the need for this program to look at graduation which it is doing in some parts of the country so you need to invest even with the money you have if you can invest uh, in people's skills because we have seen that where people do have land where they do have small businesses inflation hasn't hit them as hard because agriculture uh, commodity prices have gone up so they're selling those things more expensive or you know whatever the small businesses produce um my earlier example was of course sindh and, and dadu which is you know there's landlessness there's no facilities etc but if you go into you know peri urban parts of uh, punjab then it's a very different story um so yes of course bisp is helping but i think that uh, you know the the longer term plan uh, of bisp in terms of graduating people out with three or four inputs is is very very important 
When, when you say graduating, Chandani, you mean that people that are currently on the program, uh, potentially for them to no longer be on the program and for them to have a different uh, instrument of improved incomes? That's right. So, you know, BISP uses a poverty scorecard and we use the same scorecard. Uh, and we have seen that, uh, and this has been in, in Balochistan and, and the center of Sindh, nine districts. Uh, and the government of Sindh is doing a similar program, putting a lot of investment into that, the People's Poverty Reduction Program, where if from year one, where you, you mobilize, you organize people, and you have inputs like um, uh, skills training, access to finance, uh, some amount of infrastructure and uh, for, for nutrition, uh, malnutrition, water sanitation infrastructure is very key. Over a three-year period, we've seen people move out of the lowest poverty bands into the higher ones. Uh, what is happening in some parts is, and Balochistan is a case in point only because we have data from that, which I said earlier, is that some of, some of those people have dropped back in to those poverty bands uh, when we looked at you know, the year between 2020 and 2022. And that is inflation, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's a really key point. The, the fact that where we do have uh, data and evidence, that evidence is pointing towards a dire situation where rather than moving on up, we have uh, people that are that are slipping back in. Uh, but Stephen, can you just many... add, Musharraf, uh, you know, doc, Dr. Stephen Henke's point? We, I mean, the crisis has come upon us because over decades, this is where we've brought ourselves. I mean, if you look at... Uh, you look at Dadu, I mean, you know, first of all, there's, there's landlessness. Most people are labor sitting on land. Uh, you know, literacy levels are extremely low. And, uh, stunting levels are high. There, were, there are no lady health workers. We had to put in over, you know, over like, I think it's, the figure is in probably in the 900s, lady health workers, right? 791 community health workers just to tell people about malnutrition and to speak to women in villages about their children and explain to them what malnutrition is. There were no nutrition stabilization centers. They've been set in, put in through this EU funded donor program. And luckily the government has, has committed, you know, so far to, to continue with these. But, you know, it's not today, right? What about 1947 onward? And I think this is the, this is the question we need to ask ourselves. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Steve, th this, uh, these kinds of challenges are not uh, unique to Pakistan, but, but the examples you gave uh, of Bulgaria, Estonia, Lithuania, those are all countries with a population. Uh, you, won't, you won't strangle me if I get this wrong, but I doubt any of them have a population much larger than a couple of neighborhoods in Karachi. Uh, you know, Pakistan is a country of 234 million the sort of profundity of the scale of the problem in Pakistan, the fact that you have parts of Pakistan that have the human development levels of, you know, places in Italy, and you have many parts of Pakistan where you have human development level indicators uh, that, that are comparable with sub-Saharan Africa. This kind of wide disparity makes the political guts that it takes to kind of invest in a solution like a currency board to establish the kind of foreign relations and strategic relations that will enable uh, deposits in the foreign exchange reserves in this country that would enable a currency board and that would produce the political action that is required from a fiscal perspective to tax the rich and to subsidize the poor, which is really fundamental to this whole thing. Do you do you see that as a realistic set of uh, aims that 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 we can uh, that we can sort of imagine Pakistan could embark on, or do you think that there is more pain that needs to be experienced here before the Pakistani elite comes uh, perhaps to its senses? Steve, just make sure you unmute yourself before you speak. Okay, so uh, if the, the first point about size is that I really think that's, that's kind of a, a red herring. I think it's completely irrelevant uh, uh, in terms of the, the situation. L let me go back uh, again. This is, a, this is a small size country 
but uh, a very good one to illustrate what's involved. Singapore became independent in 1965, as you know, and the situation there was pretty dire, actually. They, 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 there, were, there was a tremendous ethnic potential, ethnic conflict uh, and civil war. The poverty level was extreme, uh, one of the poorest places on the, on the planet in 1965. Well, they got a leader, number one, <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew, who was one of the great leaders of the 20th century. And they started by focusing on the stability. And again, the key is stability might not be everything, but everything is nothing without stability. And you can't do any of these reforms unless you have a stable environment. So what did they do? They had a currency board. They started with a currency board. And Lee Kuan Yew also put in place the following. No passing of the begging bowl. No foreign aid would be accepted by Singapore. They were going to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Corruption would be zero. Private property and safety were a key compo components of, this, of the Singapore strategy. They were going to have a competitive economy and competitive industry. And they would get that by having free trade and the, and the competition that's involved with having open trade. The government would be small, efficient. They would pay first class civil servants, first class wages. What, what did that generate? That generated that one of the richest pla places on the planet right now is Singapore. They went from someplace like Pakistan in 1965 to, to where they're at today. And the key to it was the currency board. The currency board put the politicians in a fiscal straitjacket and the institutions, that, that is a strong institution. You have to have a strong institution and a currency board is. So, so that, that's the illustration. And, and there have been over 70 currency boards, by the way. At, at one point in, in the uh, early 20th century, almost all of Africa had currency boards. Of course, they were colonial institutions, so some people didn't, didn't like them. When, when the countries became independent, they got rid of the currency boards and, and disaster struck. It's been disaster ever since without the institution that reigns in the politicians on the fiscal side. So, so I, 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 I think this is kind of a false critique, the size thing. And another critique that's completely false is that Oh, you have to have a lot of preconditions. You have to meet this, that, and the other thing. If you listen to the IMF, they'll tell you a thousand things you have to do before you could have a currency board. No, we put in a currency board in Estonia in 1992. We put it in in 30 days. The, the Russian ruble was the currency in the newly independent Estonia. They didn't even have a currency. We, we created one, the Estonian kroon. We put it in in 30 days with the currency board. Everything got stabilized and, and the economy has been booming ever since. By the way, in terms of discipline, what are the two countries with the lowest debt to GDP ratios in Europe, in the, in the European Union? Estonia is number one and Bulgaria is number two. So I, I'm talking about reality. I, I'm a realist. And, and if you want to fix this endemic problem you have in Pakistan, you, you must put the politicians in a straitjacket and, and stop playing games as they've been doing. The model being used in Pakistan is obviously a, a complete disaster. If you, if you go down any of them, if you look at, for example, the World Bank governance indicators, they, they have. Yeah, absolutely. Steve, there's no I, I don't think anybody here or anybody watching is going to debate the, 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 the wider point, which is that the, the country does need uh, some, frankly, some some radical thinking about how this is going to get solved. I want to.
because because we're focusing on on the economic yeah. impact of uh, yeah. this crisis on on people's food security steve i want to come back yeah. on, on, on go let, ahead let me let me let me let me comment just briefly on that if i may uh mishara uh, we're, we're so so we we're in a we're in a crisis now in pakistan because of these long-term endemic problems plus the flood completely wiped agriculture out plus we ha have the war in ukraine that's disrupted uh, the food supply chains and, and so forth. So so we have a short term problem, but the, the big problem is going to be the next 10 years in agriculture because uh, uh, Adil mentioned uh, uh, relative prices, food relative to other things. We're not talking about inflation. We're talking about in inflation is the general price level going up and going down. Adil was talking about relative prices, food prices relative to other prices in the economy. And, and those, I think, we're going to see a real problem because with the fall of the Soviet Union, we had a tremendous increase in world food productivity. They privatized everything that had been collectivized in the former Soviet Union and the agricultural sector and we had a huge increase in agricultural output. We've had somewhat the same situation in China, by the way, after Deng's 1979 speech and the opening up of China. Productivity in agriculture has increased tremendously in China. Well, that's kind of come to a stop now. And going forward, we're, we're facing a lot of policies that are not conducive towards lower food prices relative to other things. And to get the relative food prices under control, there have to be policies that support agriculture production. Now, Absolutely. We've got to place uh, Steve, we're about to run out of, we're about to run out of time. And I do want to give the other participants a chance okay. to sort of weigh in on a couple more questions. Okay. But I think your point on, on food security and how it's related to the wider economic crisis is well taken. And I'm going to take that point to Adil. Adil, one of the things that appeals to me about the me currency, about the currency war, if, if we are to, we are to take uh, sorry, I'm going to mute you for a second because there's an echo. So uh, you unmute as soon as I finish asking the question. I'm sorry for being long winded. If we do take the currency board idea forward, one clear benefit would be the kind of fiscal sovereignty that Pakistan theoretically would regain. And for me, the immediate benefit, and, and I'll take this point to Shandana later on, but one of the immediate benefits would be that Pakistan would eventually be able to finance something like a universal uh, basic income. So that rather than thinking about graduating people up and out of the uh, something like BISP, we would be thinking about actually establishing a baseline uh, universal income uh, for all citizens. Um, because I think that there's a lot of potential in the UBI idea. Is that a realistic aspiration for this country from where you're sitting or, or is it kind of, you know, sort of whimsical nonsense, given the, the complexity of the existing crisis. Other, other. So I think Steve can comment better whether uh, a currency board where we are, where the idea is to put uh, politicians ability to spend uh, in a fiscal straight jacket, uh, whether it will support the ability of or the capacity of the state to also finance uh, unconditional cash transfers on a on a larger scale am i audible just by the way just checking in yes absolutely. yes absolutely all right so while uh, i completely uh, respect steve's point about uh, how uh, a currency board can help uh, control uh, pakistan's uh, other crisis of uh, uh, endless spending by the state which drives uh, inflation on the monetary side on the but we also have to account for another element which is that if we are talking about putting more money in people's hands whether through unconditional cash transfers or by raising minimum wage or any other uh, tool would that help control inflation especially in the food sector unless we resolve the supply side problems first 
Now, in my opinion, yes, I very strongly believe that minimum wage needs to be raised immediately in the near term because of the level of erosion in purchasing power that we have seen that in my opinion is driving people not just towards malnourishment but also towards hunger again in the near term. But at the same time, there are certain steps that I believe we can take to resolve the problem on the supply side by addressing key issues, let's say in the wheat market, in the grains market, in, in the fats market or in the protein market, for example. For example, uh, uh, so far as wheat is concerned, we all understand that the prices have escalated both internationally and due to a supply, su supply demand mismatch uh, domestically. At the same time, when you are facing a situation that you do not have enough basic grain, you also have a uh, neighbor next door which has a surplus, at least a surplus to provide you seeds for the upcoming season for plantation. When you also have uh, weak border controls and you see massive arbitrage uh, and and pilferage of uh, these commodities, which are which are virtually uh, which virtually rise a lot uh, in the prices every time you see currency depreciation and the arbitrage opportunity escalates because you have a weak currency. You can address that by importing cheaper uh, grains, cheaper vegetables from from the neighbor next door. Similarly. If you don't want, okay, so may, maybe you don't, you don't want to do that for for, for political reasons or, or di di diplomatic reasons. But what you could maybe do is not make other commodities more expensive. The, today, commodities such as milk, which is a, a very high source of protein and fat for a large swath of population, uh, commodities such as poultry and eggs are only expensive because of poor policies and some of those issues can be addressed in a very in the very near term you have seed technologies available that have been in uh, that have been placed on the back burner for over five seven years with approved seeds that that yield uh, that work in this country and will yield not only enough to lower the cost of production of uh, your dairy and of your cattle and of your of your poultry industry but also may generate an exportable surplus in a year or two you have the ability to import pulses now pulses and import of pulses is something that is routinely demonized in this country as if that uh, this is a failed country for not being able to grow uh, lentils and pulses and dals you know when it is something when when you actually uh, calculate the impact of uh, pulses on the food inflation it is one of the lowest the impact of of uh, of palm oil, banaspati, uh, while I acknowledge it is an inferior cal caloric source, is one of the lowest or the long term uh, because it is the cheap source of energy for the for, for, for the poor. Same goes for sugar. What you need to do is make sure those distortions in some of those micro level sectors is, are addressed so that at least you can open up some fiscal, some financial space for the bottom of the pyramid without adding more burden on the state uh, through, uh, through BISP or UBI. Thank you, uh, Adil. I think that's uh, super helpful as we're kind of beginning to come to the close. I just want to quickly give Farhana uh, a chance to weigh in with any final thoughts. One thing that I think is really obvious to me, at least, is that we have, uh, I think, a series of things that we have to solve. There are some immediate supply side type issues that can be resolved quickly. We have the BISP instrument and uh, unconditional cash transfers, as well as targeted subsidies that can address in the short term. And then, of course, uh, important policy proposals like a currency board uh, in the medium to longer term. I, I don't see I, I, I take the point Steve has made about being able to turn it around in 30 days. But without a resolution of the wider politics, uh, those bigger questions might take longer. But some of these things can be resolved relatively quick. Farhana? Parana, you'll have to unmute if you want to add anything before we close out. Yeah, so my last word would be uh, to develop the human capital by lifting the uh, the poor out of the poverty. So these are like the last words and uh, any mechanism that government or the private sector, uh, involvement of the private sector, uh, because we know uh, there's a huge potential in the private sector that we haven't discussed uh, during the session. Uh, can be tapped on. So uh, I know that uh, more people are going uh, below the poverty line in Pakistan, but at the same time, there are several uh, potential opportunities 
supply uh, in several sectors of philanthropy um, that can be done. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Shandana, I think that lines up well with the point you were making earlier, that when we invest in the human capital of these communities, there's we, we've seen evidence of people growing out of that uh, poverty scorecard where where their BIS payments are, are due to where they're not sort of in that uh, in that same population. But but again, that does seem to be more of a medium and longer term plan uh, immediately. Uh, other than dramatic improvements or increases in BISP and more targeted subsidies, whether it's petrol for motorcycles or utility stores or this wheat flour scheme that I mentioned by the Prime Minister. Are there other things that we can do in the very short term? Well, I think, you know, such schemes, obviously, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> such schemes in, in Islamabad, I don't know if they're really a, a priority because there are parts of the country that deserve <laughs> deserve this much more. Uh, and I think the outreach is important. You know, it's very easy to say, you know, money should come into the country and things will be all right. But that is not the case. I mean, if this money hasn't reached the poorest, and this is what Dr. Farhana is saying, for, you know, over 70, uh, however many number of years it is, then you, you need strategies and policies and organizations who will ensure that that happens. Because, because this, this uh, and we haven't talked about the social impacts of what is happening and what will happen. This, this difference between people, this growing difference is you know, leading to many, many more problems uh, than apart from poor people not having enough to eat and being malnutritioned. And we can, and we can see that. Uh, I mean, this is why you know, we keep harping on about if we have organized over 50 million people, why doesn't the government work directly with those people to deliver essential services? And this is the, a constant struggle. I, I think that's a sobering note, uh, uh, Shandana. I do want to give Steve a chance to sort of add uh, a closing thought, and then I'll give Adil the last word. Steve? Okay, am I unmuted now? You are. Can you hear me now? Yes, sure. loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay, fine. The, the, the follow up on one point uh, Adil made that's very important going forward for the next 10 years free trade and food has to be very encouraged because now we're having more and more restrictions and, and this is a, poses a big problem. Uh, so I, I I totally agree with his point uh, about that. Uh, I would also point out that right now we're really uh, shutting down a lot of agriculture. You, you have to realize Europe, for example, the Dutch government has put over a thousand farms out of business because they're fighting CO2 and nitrogen problems. So we, we have to be promoting policies that support food production. And we're going in the opposite direction. That's point number one, because of restrictions on trade. And a, a lot of the green policies are very anti-food production, by the way. And we, we have lost this huge increase in productivity that came after China opened up in 1979 and the Soviet Union fell. So we, we've, we're missing that. So we, we have big food challenges globally going forward in the next 10 years. So if you put Pakistan in that mix, it, the picture looks pretty bad. Equally sobering or perhaps even more so. Adil, I hope you, I can, hope you can give us something positive, something positive to close out. I don't actually because I uh, because I would like to summarize it with by saying that this is at least the worst inflationary cycle in the food basket since 50s if not since the inception of Pakistan and Pakistan may be one God forbid one natural disaster away from a situation of scarcity or famine this uh, the crisis of hunger needs to be center stage more often 
and whatever can be done in the near term in the form of minimum wage, minimum wage increases, unconditional cash transfers, and removing of distortions that can be removed immediately needs to be done to make sure that we do not face uh, that situation. Can't hear you, Mushev. Yeah, Musharraf, your sound. Your sound is gone. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. Okay. We hear you. Yeah, I, I, I was just summarizing. Uh, let me do it much more quickly uh, since we're over time. Uh, first, to thank all four of you. This was a really enlightening discussion. Uh, I think what I take away is is the immediate need. Uh, Adil, I think that's a really good summary. The, the the importance of a minimum wage increase, the importance of cash transfers through BISP, uh, improving trade, uh, reducing distortions. The country economic memorandum of the World Bank has talked about some fundamentals and you know we didn't really talk about the gendered aspects of this although you know like i said at the top of the conversation nutrition is is it is an anti-woman issue the fact that malnutrition is as bad as as it is the prof the most profoundly affected in that are women and certainly that world bank document deals with that but but you're right poor policies uh, poor statements by ministers i think we had the soybean crisis that caused the inflation in poultry those are the kinds of things that are easily avoidable. And then I think we need to have bolder, uh, more radical conversations. Uh, and I think that having Steve on the panel today was really useful in terms of demonstrating that this A, that this kind of a crisis isn't new, uh, that other countries have stood in the same place Pakistan is in today. Uh, and perhaps maybe the most positive thing that I could end on is to point to the examples that Steve gave as countries that when they decided to discipline themselves and act with fiscal responsibility and with care for the hungry and the poor and the vulnerable in their countries, that those countries were able to come out of this kind of a crisis. With that hope and with that prayer, with my profound thanks to Dr. Steve Hankey. Hankey to continues to demonstrate his importance to our national discourse on, on important issues, including this one, and to Dr. Farhan Shai. I, I thank all, uh, all of you, and I thank all those that joined us for this conversation. I look forward to welcoming you back to the Bad Lab and look forward to feedback from the viewers on what we got right and what we didn't in this conversation so we can make it better next time. My prayers and my thanks to everyone. Khuda Hafiz. Hafiz. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. Thanks, everyone.